Welcome to The Riff, where writer and investor Bern Hobart and I discuss the major inflection points caused by technological change. Our weekly conversation covers the obvious and not so obvious ways in which markets and businesses will adapt as a result. Let's jump right in. Hey, Bern, how's it going? Pretty good. How are you? Doing great. Shall we get to it? Let's get to it. Awesome. Let's start by talking about pivots in hardware or pivots in, in hard tech more broadly. Rather. Yeah. Well, I guess in this case, hard tech and hardware, they end up being being pretty similar and often overlapping categories. So I was thinking about this because there, there has been a lot of interest shared by me in investing in gadgets rather than lines of code, like thing, physical things that do things in the physical world, whether it's drones or robots for construction or robots for surgery or components for, for all of the above. Um, and you know a lot of these companies they are hybrid hardware and software companies, but there there has been more interest in that, and I think that there is maybe this temptation to pattern match and say, well, if you knew that software was going to be the really big thing twenty years ago, you would have done very well for yourself, and the big thing today you will do similarly well. But software just it has really amazing economics that have somehow just not been impeded by um, have, have in fact been mostly enhanced by industry changes and by more money and talent flowing into the sector. Like usually that when that happens, the gains get competed away. But in this case, it's it's a more complementary. And so I was thinking about some of those parallels. And one of the things I thought about was a lot of early stage investors, you know, when when you're too early, when you're early stage enough that doing a discounted cash flow analysis is actually just a completely pointless exercise. You you do care about the the team, you care about how big the market for this product is, and or you care about the team, you care about their idea, and you care about how big the market is if if their idea works. And that in software, you can lean way towards just betting on teams. And you can you can think of this, you know, the the classic two by two matrix where if you bet on the team and you think the idea is stupid about the people pursuing it are great. Well, if you were right that the idea is stupid and they never change it, maybe they weren't so great after all. And if you were right about the team, then maybe they don't change the idea and you were actually wrong about the idea, but because you picked the right people and trusted them with your money, things worked out. And you know, the other cases, it's kind of kind of a similar thing where it all depends on companies being able to cost effectively ditch their previous idea and move on to something else. And in, in software, you know, it's never trivial, but it's often doable. And in fact, in many cases, like some of the great pivots have been either companies creating a feature as a demonstration of their product and then realizing that that feature was actually a product people wanted more so than they wanted whatever, whatever the company really wanted to sell. So Yandex, for example, they started out trying to do enterprise search. So if you had a bunch of Russian language documents, they'd be able to search those documents for you. And then they created just a search portal as a way to demonstrate that, yes, we can actually parse text in Cyrillic and, you know, give you good results. And then that turned into the main business. Pixar are kind of similar, like, you know, they, they figured that they could use the workstations they were trying to sell to make movies, like short movies that would demonstrate how good these workstations were. And they were actually very good at making movies. So that's what they pivoted to. And I guess that is kind of a, a hardware pivot, actually. But uh, I think in general, the more that the work is defined by writing lines of code and by you know, writing code to solve intermediate problems and then trying to use that to build up to whatever problem you're ultimately trying to solve, like... You can pivot into those intermediates, or you can find out that you were actually solving an inter intermediate problem. And that by doing so, you learned about whatever the big problem was that you should be going after instead. And I think the the analog in hard tech is that a lot of these companies, they, they have multiple technical milestones where there are questions about something being either physically possible or just being economically feasible to do within the US. And so, you know, sometimes... Sometimes you just have to spend a lot of money to find out if if this universe is compatible with whatever really interesting quantum thing or fusion thing you want to be working on. And in other cases, you like the, the product does make sense, but and if you were building it in Shenzhen, you would have a pretty easy time doing it. But building it in the US means you know you you're working at one pace and then some of your suppliers are working at a much slower pace and not necessarily delivering things at the right level of quality. So a lot of the hard tech startups do have to insource more of what they do. And that actually creates an interesting kind of pivot environment where if a company realized that the limiting factor in building their new version of, you know, their new drones was you know, some some chip or some camera or something like that, and that they had to build that themselves, they are creating an ecosystem where now those intermediate products are more widely available. And I think this is this is part of what has made software growth so explosive 
it, like if you look at this, the pace at which companies can accelerate once they hit product market fit, that, that pace has gone up a lot. And one reason for it is that a lot of the problems that they would have to work out a way to solve are now solved by some third party. So you don't have to come up with some policy for managing source code. You use GitHub and it's it's done for you. You're, you know, you're paying some amount per employee, but it's a lot cheaper than trying to roll your own system. Similarly, you're trying, you know, if you're running a growing organization, you need to solve just how do we do inter-office communications? And it turns out that Slack was it was actually a pivot from a different product. They just turned the instead of building, I think it was a game, they they turned their intra-company communications chat tool into into a product, and so I think it'll be interesting to see how much of that happens in in this in this space where you have a company where their goal was get to Mars, and then it turns out they can't quite get to Mars, but they can sell a lot of rocket components to people who are also not going to quite going to get to Mars, but will actually need to buy a lot of rockets. And I think that. When you, when you have a setup like that, you can actually bet on the expected rate of return for investing in the category actually going up as more money moves in because there are so many specific problems that have to get solved and so many of those problems turn out to have broader applications. So I think that in that sense, you can actually kind of go back to the original pattern matching idea, but where it gets tricky is that you are betting more on the idea. And if the idea is wrong, there has to be some pretty similar, almost adjacent idea that some other good team is going to pursue such that there will actually be a customer for the, the intermediate output. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and say more about why this ends up as a positive for, for big tech. Not for, for big tech. This would be for, for the hard tech, deep tech, or whatever you want to call it space that there will just be more cases where instead of asking how how are we going to solve this problem it's more like we're going like which of the three companies that have solved this problem are we going to buy a solution from and once you can do that then you just you spend a lot more of your time working on whatever is actually unique to your use case rather than problems that every other company has it's just an interesting way that the the supply chain gets denser within a given category as more money flows into it and so the maximum achievable growth rate within that category actually goes up as the category gets more overhyped. And then you have a great feedback loop there where, you know, nothing, nothing accelerates hype like companies setting records for how quickly they went to some, some revenue run rate or how quickly they went from founding to IPO or something. So you actually, maybe that, that is the time to really worry about hype is actually if this thesis comes true, that there will be a lot of companies that grow even faster than the previous generation of hard tech companies. And if, and that, that, that fast growth, you know, it's not an illusion. There is just a higher speed limit when an industry gets enough capital to have a dense network of suppliers, but you can't necessarily extrapolate that forever. At some point, growth does kind of mean revert or the the really good obvious ideas do get taken, they do get pursued. And so the next crop of ideas, you know, it's it's easier to execute than it would have been 10 years before, but it's also an idea that would not be the idea you would have tried to execute that far before. It would not It would have been further down in your list of interesting ideas to go after. That, that makes sense. Let's talk about open source and closed source security models. Yeah, yeah. So we've had some, some fun headline flow in the security world. There was a Microsoft breach that actually happened last summer where some Packers, we presume state sponsor, were able to get access to Outlook accounts, including Outlook accounts at U.S. government agencies. They were able to read people's emails ahead of negotiations with presumably the Chinese, that they were able to read emails ahead of Chinese government negotiations with the U.S., which obviously gives them some, some advantages there. And what happened more recently was that uh, there was a, a government report on just what happened and what could have happened differently. And it was it was pretty harsh on Microsoft. I, I think reasonably, like justifiably so, you know, Microsoft is, they, they are a critical infrastructure provider for communications technology. They do have a responsibility to make sure those communications are safe. And they, they just didn't, didn't tick all the right boxes. And like when you, if you look at that report, it is interesting to think of how many things had to go wrong. So the, the hackers, they were able to get a, a signing key so they could actually generate valid login tokens for Outlook Web. And then it turned out there were some circumstances in which you could use that to access enterprise accounts instead of consumer accounts. And then the signing keys were supposed to be rotated periodically, but there had been some attempt to rotate keys before that had actually caused an outage at Microsoft. So they'd stopped rotating the keys, but had not gotten around to figuring out what the new key rotation policy was. So basically the hackers, they did something something to actually get the initial breach. And we still don't know what Microsoft had a guess, but that guess, um, they were excessively confident in that guess when they first put it out, which is that 
there was a memory dump that was accessible on the public internet. They thought that was where the key was recovered. It turns out that was probably not not the case. At least they haven't been able to find any instance where that would have that would have been the explanation. Like the the hackers had to get lucky many times, and they had to very skillfully exploit their luck, and they had to not over exploit it to the point that the the U.S. negotiators would realize that the their counterparties from the on the Chinese side had clearly been reading their emails. So like a lot of a lot of things had to go right for the hackers. A lot of things had to go wrong for the for the victims. And there is a similar analogy to the the recent open source case where someone signed up to be a contributor to a kind of obscure library, but a library that's used in a lot of different products and made useful contributions over many years and gradually got more authority over the repository and then found a very clever way to insert some kind of backdoor. And then this actually got spotted very luckily by a researcher who noticed that SSH was half a second slower than usual. And he investigated it and it turned out actually to be, I think it was actually a bug in the back door that was causing a slower login in certain cases. So again, very, very luck driven. But when you have a situation that is kind of driven by these contingencies and driven by luck, what you have to assume is that there are definitely cases right now where someone has lucked their way into access to something that they shouldn't have access to and that we we can't necessarily count on the same luck on the defensive side. So like my, my general approach, my general thinking on cybersecurity has been that whenever there's a breach, it is probably not the worst ongoing breach or not the worst breach that will happen in, in the near future and that we may not hear about the worst ones because the more comprehensive an attack is, the more successful it is, the more the more likely it is that the people who did that are a state sponsored actors who are pretty pretty patient and you know aware of the trade offs of using data, and b that when they 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 want to have like a slight data advantage, they want to synthesize a certain amount of luck, but not a suspicious amount of luck. So you know it's like if you are if, if someone is cheating in in a card game. They don't want to always make the exact optimal bet that you would make if you had perfect knowledge. At that point, the other side knows you're cheating. But if you are always making, if you are often making good bets and you sometimes happen to get very lucky and you do just have a little bit more luck than expected, but it's within the normal bounds of luck, that's a really good advantage, but it's not an advantage that is necessarily visible in some kind of statistical or anecdotal analysis kind of way. The broader point is on on security generally that we are just increasingly living in a software mediated world where more and more devices are are networked and they are they're interacting with other software and not just interacting with the end user and that does just mean that there are there's a larger surface area for attacks so you know you have to worry about your smart fridge being secured and 20 years ago you did not generally have to worry that your fridge would be this attack vector for your other other hardware and you also you know the, the stakes are a lot higher because yeah, there's there's like a larger surface area, and then there's more stuff that you could access once you have that initial breach. So it it is definitely a problem to take seriously. It is actually a problem that many companies, including Microsoft, take seriously. And Microsoft has done, which I think is really admirable, is that they they have this policy of basically building all their security around the assumption that there has like you should assume that there's a breach. Like you should build things that work on the assumption that hackers have gotten into something and. That does entail a lot of lo- logging. It entails a lot of just kind of annoying security overhead, but annoying security overhead, you know, things like having two-factor authentication and locking down some devices and giving everyone really fine green permissions for everything they do. Like a lot of that stuff is annoying, but it's a way less annoying than actually getting hacked. So I do think like cyber cyber risk, it is this, you know, ongoing looming liability. People know about it, but it's it's always impossible to estimate the real scope of it. I, I think every time the power goes out, I wonder if, you know, this time the power doesn't come back on in a couple of minutes or, you know, a day or two, but it comes on in like two weeks. And that's when I find out that Taiwan has been invaded or something. I, I do think that something like that is reasonably likely to happen. And just very, it's very hard to estimate the probabilities there. But companies are taking it more seriously, and the U.S. government is also taking it more seriously. And so even though the the scope of breaches that are happening now is always going to be invisible, and the really severe ones are probably less visible than average because they're being used more judiciously than average, the, the scope of countermeasures is also also something that you you know about only very very far in retrospect so you should just i guess you should have a wide range wide wide confidence interval for thinking about how likely it is that there will be some apocalyptic speed of hacking versus you know there is this this non-zero it's low but non-zero probability that actually 
that was the high watermark that like the solar winds attack was pretty much the last really big one that will happen to to the US and that there will still be incidents and accidents and things, but they will gradually diminish in severity. We'll get back to the conversation in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Hey everyone, Eric here. At Turpentine, we're building the first media outlet for tech people by tech people. We're the network behind the show you're listening to right now. We have a slate of hit shows across a range of topics and industries, from our AI and investing cluster of podcasts, to shows that drive the conversation in tech with the most interesting thinkers, founders, investors, and influencers, like Econ 102 with Noah Smith. We're launching new shows every week, and we're looking for industry-leading sponsors. If you think that might be you and your company, email me at erikaturpentine.co. That's E-R-I-K at turpentine.co, and let's partner together. The other week, we chatted about sort of the Vanilla Kosla, Mark Andreessen debate as it relates to open source in AI, and we talked about the different merits of, of, of those positions. Do you have a perspective on what's likely to happen in, or like what's likely to be our regulatory stance if you had to, if you had to bet on it? I think I'm, I'm very ideologically sympathetic to the idea of open source software being intrinsically more secure because you can just look at the code. That was that was not really the case with the most recent breach because there was actually one set of source code that was displayed on um, on GitHub or whatever version control service they were using. And then if you actually downloaded the executable, it included other extraneous stuff, which was basically or not extraneous of it, when you download the executable, you are generally, it's it's generally downloading some stuff that is kind of doing a little bit of the setup work for you. So you don't have to mess around with like building the the actual software from source code, like you're, you're downloading a more complete version. But that doesn't mean that the actual source code that people were inspecting did not have the backdoor. I, I guess that is, that is a case where if you are really thoughtful about your mental model, you might recognize that as an attack vector. It was not something that occurred to me as a meaningful attack vector before this happened, but now I think about it all the time. So I think it's it, it, it's possible that there will be among among the larger Linux distributions and the more security focused ones, and you know that that applied to the open source community as a whole. That there there will probably be more of a culture of auditing things and of making sure that the the ostensible source code is also the actual source code that customers are running on their machines, or that users are running on their machines. I th- I actually think that there there are interesting possibilities for for AI driven security in particular. You know, it is increasingly straightforward to put some code into an LLM and ask it, okay, what what does this code do? What's it for? And if the code is deliberately obfuscated, then the LLM is not necessarily going to figure out exactly what it's for, but it will at least tell you, like, I have no idea. And so that allows you to to ask questions and get, you know, and then that doesn't mean that the, the hackers can't react to that. Like maybe if they do create something that is a backdoor, but also serves some genuine purpose and that it's unclear which which piece of code does what, but it does mean they need a more elaborate cover story. And that, that actually, that constrains both how quickly they can launch backdoors into things and also just how many opportunities they have to do that. There could be some cases where you just can't come up with something that is both a feature someone would actually want and a good good way to insert some kind of obscure backdoor function. That makes sense. But let's transition to what you wrote about Google and, and charging for AI features. Yeah, yeah. So there was a story in the Financial Times a week or two ago that was floating this rumor that Google is considering charging for AI features. And I think there are two ways to look at this, one of which is that it is just a whole lot more expensive to serve an LLM generated result or a generative AI result generally than it is to serve standard search search page like that. People at Google have, I'm sure, spent a lot of time optimizing every last bit of the cost of serving those search pages. So, and, you know, at scale, it's definitely not free, but you know, it rounds down, it rounds close enough to free that Google has has not had to consider charging people for search outside of outside of the enterprise search context. It was an earlier part of their business. And that just, it was, that was a much worse business than doing, giving people a free search product that was really good and then gradually incorporating ads into it. And I do, I do continue to think that LLM results are actually a better place to monetize than organic search is that you can, you can do more subtle things with the ad load. It is closer to a conversation. That conversation can be steered in a more lucrative direction and it can incorporate a lot of information from both what the user has said in their previous interactions with this product and also how they're responding to this conversation. So 
you can actually, you can imagine search engines doing some kind of dynamic ad load thing based on whether or not the user seems annoyed that the, the messaging is too commercial. You can imagine users responding to that by just by default, you know, having, having some kind of fine tuned prompt of their own that is like, also, please don't show me any ads the way that, um, so a long time ago, Gmail was more of an ad supported server. Like Gmail had some ads. The ads were semi contextual, but it was like, I, I, I forget like Google, Google definitely wanted to avoid the impression, giving the impression that they were reading everybody's emails and targeting ads based on their personal information, but they, they were running ads, but someone actually found out that you you wouldn't see ads on emails about tragedies. And they eventually came up with a sentence that you could put in your email signature that was just very dense and full of references to blood, bombs, death, you know, cancer, all these things. And if you had enough of those words in your email, then Google would assume that this email is about something depressing and would not want to show you ads against that. So I I could see people doing that in search. But then, then again, I, I never personally encountered this email signature as an organic thing. I encountered it as a new story about clever hacks that you can use to stop seeing ads. People do tend to ostensibly like vocally dislike ads. They don't take that many countermeasures against ads. And a lot of people who do take pretty aggressive countermeasures, like, you know, installing ad blockers and just not, not using ad support services at all. They just tend to be people who are not worth advertising very much to anyway. So it ends up being kind of economically insignificant. And I also, you know, the people are just very, very responsive to, to convenience. I'm incredibly responsive to convenience. It is, you know, your, your habits will change every time there is a slightly better way to do something that you have already been doing in the same way that it's changed the way that I do long tail searches, because I don't have to try to think to myself of, if I'm looking for some particular fact, I don't have to try to think to myself, what is the context in which someone would have a long list of similar facts that would include this fact? I can just ask the exact question and tend to get an answer. So that does indicate to me that people, to the extent that generative AI results are better than organic results, people will very quickly opt into that and they will just probably not spend that much of their time thinking about ads and and their thoughts on ads will be something that Google can infer from their searcher behavior. So what this goes back to, um, you, know, you asked, why is this good for big tech earlier? So this is actually good for big tech because having having existing distribution in search means that Google can potentially just on the fly, as they look at queries, as they're already somewhat doing, they can look at whether or not this is a good query for generative AI, but eventually they can get to looking at, is this a query where the the higher ad load or higher implicit ad load, better monetization of generative AI is worth paying an order of magnitude more to serve this page, or should we just do organic? And so Google basically always gets the, the higher margin or, you know, higher contribution margin query. If they, if it is a query like low APR credit cards, Google's just probably just going to show you a bunch of ads for low APR credit cards. And then if the query is something really complicated, but it's also something really complicated and somewhat monetizable, you know, I'm planning a trip to this location on this date, what should I see there? Then they they may choose at that point to do a, a more customized generative result instead. And because people are already habituated to going to Google, Google, Google basically has the opportunity to choose whichever option monetizes it better for them. And if someone, someone like Perplexity, like it is a cool product. I like it. I've used it a few times and I think it's it's fun, but I, what I found was that for the queries where I turned to perplexity, there were also clear queries where Google would typically give me a generative result, or they were queries where actually interacting in a pure sort format was just not the right approach for answering the question that I wanted to ask. If it's a multi-part question where I'm responding to the the incremental answer with my next question, that's a case where probably the chat interface is the best one. So I think in you know in, in those chat cases probably. Probably the the existing companies that actually have a have a brand in LLM chat will continue to do well. But for more general search queries and things that could be AI based and could be not as AI based, I think I think Google still still wins there. I, I want to segue to another company you wrote about, Lamb Weston, the potato company that tech investors keep investing in. Lamb Weston's fun. So. A couple of years ago, I, I, I regularly look at the the 13 Fs from hedge funds, just showing what they own, what they bought and sold. And I did notice that some of the tech funds that I follow, they were buying shares of a potato company. And it's a big potato company. It's a well-run potato company, but it's still a potato company. I, I didn't understand what 
what that had to do with buying SaaS companies and consumer internet stocks or whatever. And so I, I looked into it and actually wrote like a year and a half ago about what the bull case was on Lamb Weston and some of the analogies, which they're, they're kind of stretchy analogies to software, but the Lamb Weston is one of many cases where there's an industry that was historically pretty fragmented and has been consolidating and where the marginal cost of serving one more customer, if you already are serving a bunch of customers in the same geographic area, is is pretty low. So they um, they they sell a lot of potatoes to McDonald's, which means they are making a lot of deliveries to McDonald's, which means that their their route map can afford to have lots of lots of times where people segue off and deliver a couple of fries to some other restaurant instead. And the marginal cost of doing that is going to be a lot lower than the marginal cost of having having some competing company actually make a trip just to deliver the potatoes just to this company. And you know, I'm sure the logistics are not not literally that someone is driving a truck straight from the potato farm to your local McDonald's. It's uh, it's a, it's a little more complicated, a little less dumb than that. But it, you know, that that kind of thing where if you have just a denser delivery network, you do tend to be able to sell at competitive prices and pick up large and growing margins. That is that is a model that's worked in many places. When an industry consolidates and people exercise what is, you know, the uh, the investors call it pricing discipline, some of the critic, critics call it collusion. It's probably somewhere in between where like as the industry consolidates the people who are riding these companies just they do prefer more stability more predictability and they're not they're maybe gunning for market share by buying out competitors but not gunning for market share by just competing on price all the time so you know there was this nice story of continued predictable growth some margin expansion and they were growing internationally and so you can imagine the same playbook running in other countries maybe in the same way and then they they actually missed earnings last week by a large margin. And it turned out, this was just wonderfully ironic, it turned out that they missed earnings because every part of the thesis was working pretty much as expected, but they had tried to upgrade their ERP software stack and it didn't work. And so they had missed a bunch of shipments and they had a bunch of inventory that was just in their warehouses. And, you know, it's, it's agricultural inventory. It's probably not as good if it's stuck in the warehouse for a month. So they, they lost a bunch on that and they, they missed revenue estimates. They, they've had, they have way too much inventory compared to what they usually have. And I thought it was kind of this fun, ironic story where you would think that of all of the investors who would notice a software problem at some non-software company. It would be the people who mostly invest in software and have dabbled in this company. And a lot of people did get caught on the wrong side of it because they were looking at this as more of like an indirect kind of analog to the way that they think about other businesses of like industry consolidation, high incremental margins. You have these growing economies of scale. It turns out that sometimes, sometimes if you know a lot about software, what are the things you have to think is like which kinds of software products are actually hard to implement. And, you know, when I listen to earnings calls from different companies that sell different kinds of software, who says it takes a surprisingly long time to implement this at a large company? And who says this is actually pretty straightforward, no matter how big the customer is. So that was a fun one. I'm sure they'll do fine. And 13Fs, they're always this lagging thing. So you actually don't know, for all I know, all of the tech funds systematically dumped all of their Lamb West and stock, you know, weeks in advance of this earnings report, specifically because they had all decided that ERP transitions are just toxic for any company and they don't want to be involved and didn't want to take the risk. But I'm sure I'm sure somebody got caught on the wrong side of that and thought to themselves that they should be a little less abstract in their investment theses and a little bit more concrete about what what in what areas do they actually have this information advantage and how can they use it? That's a fun one. You also wrote about how when a country gets rich, stuff gets cheap and time gets expensive. And, and, and then you, you go deeper and say, this means that good customer service is a bad sign. Why don't you unpack that? Yeah. So customer service is always great during recessions because people are really, really grateful to have a job and they they really want to make sure that the the restaurant dining demographic likes them and tips well. And then ser customer service is just not nearly as good at 4% unemployment because if if someone, you know, is a little bit slow and gets the order wrong and isn't isn't especially polite or whatever, or they don't get tipped well, well, they can work somewhere else. They can get a job at an Amazon warehouse if they really want to, or they can work at a different restaurant and see if they like those customers more, et cetera. But I think that there is this broader phenomenon where, and it explains so much, like when you look at old buildings, like old cathedrals, they're all beautiful. Every detail has been very carefully thought out. If you look at modern churches, they look like a pizza hut or something. And many of them were former pizza huts or blockbusters or whatever that have been taken over by church. And one reason for that is that if everyone is desperately poor, 
it just doesn't take very much money for a wealthy person to pay someone to carve a really, really nice looking gargoyle and make really beautiful stained glass. But now, now all of those things are extremely expensive and you're paying a whole lot of money if that's what you want, you want your stuff to look like. Um, the, the anecdote that I liked that I think I kicked that piece off with was, um, there's a story I actually read in multiple sources from multiple people talking about visiting China in the 80s and early 90s and doing business there and how a an experience that some Western visitors have is it, they've been you know out all day talking to people, having meetings, whatever, and they get home, they you know get back to their hotel room, they they're getting ready for bed, they notice one of their socks has a hole in it, they think dang, and they throw it in the trash, and then. The, the next day, when they get back to the hotel from a similar day of lots of work and things, they find that someone has actually sewn the hotel, or has, has sewn the sock back together and carefully folded it and washed it, folded it, put it back on their bed, you know, done this really elaborate thing. Now, in, in a Western context, socks, you know, I, as far as I am concerned, socks are free. Like, <laughs> you just don't really think about the price of your socks. You don't think of them as this, this asset that is worth preserving and worth taking care of. You're not going to gratuitously waste them, but it's just... It's not, I don't know of any fun way to gratuitously waste socks. Um, but in a country with a GDP per capita of under $1,000 a year, like China in the early stages of its growth, like all this physical stuff is incredibly precious. It takes a lot of labor to be able to afford a given article of clothing, and you don't want to waste any of this stuff. And so they're... In poorer countries, there is a culture of you use it till it breaks, and then you fix it till it breaks again, and then you keep on fixing it until it's literally impossible to fix. And and only then do you get rid of it. But you know you get rid of it in this very gradual process of repurposing every every embodiment of previous labor into into something that is some kind of labor saving or useful device. Um, and you just you see less of that in countries as they get rich. There, I haven't heard anecdotes of that kind of thing happening. In when people visit China today, so it looks like they have they have surpassed the point at which socks are precious. But you can actually go further back in history and read about Renaissance Italy. I think it was like Renaissance or like just pre Renaissance Italy. That I think okay. So the book I'm thinking of is before the Industrial Revolution. So it is Renaissance Italy. It talked at one point about how this that area of northern Italy where the Renaissance either happened or at least accelerated a lot, depending on exactly how you how you decide these things. Um, that it was one of the wealthier parts of the world on a per capita basis, and that much of the rest of Europe would not surpass that standard of living for hundreds of years, like until the Industrial Revolution, basically. And even then, when people died, they their will would itemize their clothing. And at hospitals, they actually had to post guards because if someone died overnight, it was very, very, it was a very reasonable possibility that at least their boots would get stolen and that perhaps all of their clothes would get stolen. And so even if, if some of the richest people in the world, at least, you know, richest, richest polities in the world, if people still steal clothes off of corpses and wear the clothes, then you can tell the clothes are extremely valuable and that it takes just a lot of work to be able to afford a new shirt or something. Today, you know, I don't, I don't think that I, I will be enumerating all of my clothes and my will, you know, maybe, maybe different kids get different ironic t-shirts from my youth or something, but probably not really. It's uh, it's just a very different equation. There's been enormous deflation in the price of manufactured goods, and that's been happening since the dawn of manufacturing. And then there's been inflation in the cost of labor, and that's that is a generally good thing. Like the cost of labor that you pay when you go to a restaurant or step into an Uber or just do anything that requires human effort, that cost of labor is also the income of the person doing that work for you. And so the more expensive that labor is, the better off the lowest earners are. And as those people get better off, there are just some tasks where it no longer makes sense to pay them to do it. So restaurants tend to be like restaurants can achieve a higher standard of cleanliness in very poor countries because you can just pay someone to stand around all day holding a broom. And if anything gets dropped anywhere, immediately swoop in and clean it up. It's a lot harder to do that if you're paying that person $17 an hour in the United States. So probably things spend a little, you know, the, the dirt spends a little bit more time on the floor. Things are not quite as pristine. And I think that's you know, it, it is kind of kind of glum to think about this that basically the richer the richer your country gets the grimier it gets and the surlier the wait staff become but that is also the price of just living in a very rich country that is getting richer all the time is that 
more and more people say that whatever this task is, it is simply not worth the money. I'm, I'm going to do something else with my time and you'll just have to deal with a slightly less pristine McDonald's bathroom as a consequence. Yeah, that um, that's well articulated. And let's segue to your most recent piece, the the data business at three resolutions. Yeah, yeah. So I've been I've been thinking about this a lot recently. There is this fun new book, Means of Control, I believe is the name, which is all about the U.S. government, both law enforcement and intelligence services, buying data from private companies that collected that data mostly to target ads. And so I think I think a useful thing to think about is that if you are looking at data that is tied to an individual, there are really three resolutions you care about. One is you're using the data to do a census. You are sampling the spending behavior of millions of people or the web search behavior of billions of people or you know the, these aggregate behaviors in order to find out, I don't know, are Crocs still somehow cool or have they gotten uncool or, you know, is Celsius still awesome or have we moved on to a new stimulant? Um, all these questions, like you want this broad representative sample and you often, you can't get a, you generally can't get a comprehensive sample of what everybody's doing all the time, but you can get a subset of people's behavior and it's, it's reasonably cost-effective and, you know, requires some analytical work, but you can, you can often tease out broader trends from, from tracking the narrow behavior of a subset of people, as long as you you try to normalize your panel and then you try to avoid, there's some tricky mistakes. There's, there's this anecdote about the early days of using credit card data to predict company revenue. And I believe it like this. So there, are, there were companies that would sell anonymized credit card transaction data. And that data, it's, it's literally, you know, the users have just a random number instead of a username, but you do have data tied to individual users because you want to track things like how many people are in the panel and is there some propensity to keep spending at a certain merchant after you spent there the first time, et cetera. So it's, it's pseudonymized, not anonymized, but then you have the same the same description of the purchase that shows up on your credit card statement or and that, that description is actually from the point of sale device of whatever the seller is using. And the story is that someone was tracking revenue at Cracker Barrel and they noticed this big spike in revenue at Cracker Barrel in late late one year, like November, December. And it turned out that the reason for this was that their panel of credit card users actually skewed very heavily to the East Coast, in particular to New York City, and that they had done a fairly naive search where it was pretty much any transaction that had Cracker in the name was probably Cracker Barrel. And so they were tracking that. And then there, some of the members of the panel went to very expensive productions of the Nutcracker Suite. And so if you have a subset of your, if you have some members of your panel who are spending $20 on the breakfast special or, and, and presumably other stuff, and then you also have a few people in your panel who are dropping $800 for a bunch of tickets to ballet, those, those other people end up having a really big impact. And if the panel had a different skew last year, or if there just wasn't a big production, wasn't as expensive a production of the play last year, then your year over year numbers go crazy. So you always, you want to think about not just, is this a representative sample, but am I absolutely confident that I'm tracking exactly what I think I'm, I'm tracking and not, not also getting some extraneous stuff instead. So those are, so that's, that's one use case is like doing a census, but a lot of the data that gets collected and that eventually ends up being using this kind of analysis, it wasn't actually collected for that purpose. A lot more of it is collected for the purpose of targeting ads and special offers to people. So a, uh, a grocery store, for example, they want you to sign up for their membership program. And the reason for that is that then they know what you spend money on. They could start measuring your individual elasticity. Like if the cost of grapes goes down 10%, do you actually buy more grapes or are you indifferent? They can figure out what kinds of marketing to send to you through through direct mail or whatever. They can figure out if your, your zip code is just a you know high propensity to consume quiche zip code or whatever, and that they should, they should do something to, to exploit that. And so a lot of a lot of organizations collected that data for the purpose of targeting ads and then eventually realized that they could sell the data in bulk to people who were using it for market research and investment research instead. And they got a lot of incremental margin for that. And since their customers wanted just all the data, it was not especially expensive. You didn't have to really pick and choose which which subsets of data. They just wanted it all. And then a third data use case is tracking individuals, is breaking that pseudonymity and figuring out who is who and learning learning specific things about what they're up to. So there have been a few cases of this, and one that gets talked about in the book is, is Grindr, that it was possible for a while to just buy lots of data on 
which which users, not by username, but just you know by random number assigned to each user, which users open the app and where. And you could use that to see things like, it looks like X number of people were using the app when they're at their day job at the Pentagon or whatever. And then they are meeting people who also use the app in other places. And this can represent a security risk. Not every time, but it certainly creates this attack surface where not everyone wants their behavior on such an app to be publicized and certainly doesn't want it to be publicized widely. If someone knows about that behavior and they inform this person that they know, then maybe they can extract, they can use that as some kind of leverage. Um, there are actually private sector use cases for this. Specifically, there there have been a couple of cases where people predicted mergers by looking at the flight records of private jets. So that stuff is published publicly. A lot of the private jets are owned by holding companies, but sometimes if you are if you're very diligent, diligent at collecting data or have some some snazzy machine learning algorithms, you can kind of figure out that, okay, this jet is always in the city where this particular person is giving speeches. So even though the jet is owned by anonymous Holco LLC, it's probably this person's jet. It gets harder if the jets are shared or if there are like shared within an organization or if, if it is a jet that is fractionally owned or something, but it's a signal that there was a pharma merger a couple of years ago that a lot of arbitrary jurors made a lot of money on because they saw that I believe the, the Johnson and Johnson jet went to a particular airport in Switzerland that was very close to the headquarters of a particular pharma company. And they traded on that and did well. It sounds like insider trading because you are actually using information other people don't have in order to buy short data call options on a pending merger. It is based on the current state of the law, legal and and something people do. There's there's probably some some line that one could cross. And that was really what I wanted to get into in the piece was that there can be just a, a qualitative difference between doing something ad hoc using just human intelligence and doing exactly the same thing at scale. If you happen to be talking to a friend, your friend confesses to a crime for whatever reason, and a police officer overhears this, and your friend's confession includes some details that that is probably you know potentially enough for that police officer to get a warrant. But if they are just listening in, you know, if they have microphones in every public place in the city and they're continuously listening to everything and they're feeding all these audio files into automatic into uh, whisper or something so they get a transcript and then they have keywords or they're actually feeding that into an LLM and asking, hey, in this stretch of text, did anyone confess to a crime? At that point, it's just a, a totally qualitatively different approach where it basically means that instead of this soft expectation of privacy, you have no expectation of privacy outside of truly private areas. And and that just is, it's really, it's it's less that this is a, a good thing or a bad thing. I think you can you can sort of make a case that it is just doing law enforcement at scale, that it's not good. But I think typically when people, you know, when when the policy arena addresses the question of what should the police be allowed to do, that implicitly they're saying, given what they are capable of doing, what should we allow them to do? And sometimes the compromise is basically you are allowed to do X because we think there's absolutely no way you could accomplish X. You'd just be wasting your time. And we don't want X to happen. You want X to happen. We'll just make sure that your budget is such that you can try, but you will not you will not succeed. But now it may take a, a smaller budget to do that. I, I think it would not be not be especially expensive for the Austin Police Department to set up this sort of total surveillance system in every public place. And it would, again, be just police officers listening to conversations that people had in public without any any legal expectation of privacy. And yet it is very different having, you know, chatting with your friends when you're out, you know, when you meet up for coffee, it's a very different experience if it's you, your friends and local law enforcement all having this discussion or all, at least all, all being able to listen to this discussion. So I guess, I guess what that ultimately means is that a lot of, a lot of times the technological frontier actually just extends the frontier for disagreeing on policy, but it also forces us to confront the extent to which we actually had maybe had more fundamental disagreements than we thought. And those disagreements have been papered over by the fact that it was just infeasible for one side to get their way. So when I was writing that piece, I I, I typed out, you know, if the police go from solving 10% of crimes to solving 90% of crimes, that's a good thing. And I realized that there will be at least one person who reads that and says, no, that is actually a bad thing. There's like the optimal level crime solving at a given price point, you know, at a given cost is not 100%. 
that there is some sort of load bearing amount of just getting away with it that society actually needs. And I think that's, I, I think there, there probably is some point at which you do want it to be somewhat possible for some people to get away with some crimes, but it, it's usually that the, 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 the next thing you do to prevent the marginal crime is just such a huge privacy violation for everybody involved or is some other form of civil rights violation that there's just no, no way that it is a, a worthwhile trade-off. It's interesting. C Coleman Hughes once made the connection that to have a policy of like zeroism when it comes to getting rid of all racism, he compared it to a policy of zeroism when it comes to crime that it would involve such sort of restrictions and, and other violations that it wouldn't be worth it. And, and the goal is just to reduce it, but to to make it zero uh, would create this kind of excessive, you know, sort of police state was what he was saying. That said, you know, the concern of racism, I'm, I'm not doesn't feel as as threatening as the concern of crime and it is when you compare it to what we have in san francisco say where you can't even walk on you know streets in you know a large part of the city you know we might be willing to take those trade-offs or at least some people might be willing to take those trade-offs from a you know personal lifestyle perspective they might not from like a justice perspective or like what they think of as justice perspective but it is interesting i mean the the discourse on crime for a long time had been something like hey you know, putting more people in jail just doesn't work. Like tough on crime, it's just not effective, doesn't work. And thus we need like free therapy for everybody. You know, I'm, I'm teasing a little bit, but you sort of, you know, softer interventions, redistributive, you know, distribution is just restorative justice, sorry. And then Bukele and El Salvador comes in and like gets rid of crime, you know, with, you know, very heavy handed policies or at least, you know, drastically reduces the murder rate, something like 90% or, or, or whatever it was. And then you say, okay, well, how much can we learn from El Salvador? You know, it, and so, yeah, it's interesting to see how the discourse on crime is developing with further examples, but also, as you mentioned, just the ability of technology to to to, pre to prevent it or to identify it. This is actually an ambiguous payoff from technology that if you have really good facial recognition and there's a lot of location based data that people are trading, they're, they're sharing voluntarily, that shoplifting is just an optional feature of society. Like it does not have to happen. And then, you know, there's, there's a large number of people who would think, okay, shoplifting doesn't have to happen. I don't shoplift. I don't like that people shoplift. I don't like that. I have to ask, you know, I have to track down the, someone at CVS and tell them I need to buy deodorant. Can you please unlock it from behind this bulletproof glass or whatever? On the other hand, there is apparently a cohort. They're very active on Twitter who believe that shoplifting is a moral good and that we actually need to do more of it. And, you know, they're, they are part of the political process. And at some point, you know, getting, getting anything done means at least having a conversation with the, yes, I think shoplifting is good people. And you do have to figure out, okay, do you, do you mean I'm sympathetic to the people who shoplift? And I think that our system, like any system that puts people in a position where they're tempted to do that is just an unjust system and you should attack it. So it's sort of, I don't know. It, it's not quite accelerationism, but it is like, you know, that, that flavor of things. And then I think there, there's potentially a set of people who, you know, like who believe that it is like striking back against big business and that it's it's ethical to shoplift against Fortune 500 companies, but not ethical to shoplift against small businesses, which I think is dubious in many ways. Among other things, big companies do tend to pay better on average. They're way more compliant with laws because they have to be because it's just not big news if a mom and pop store, I don't know, violates labor laws and doesn't doesn't pay people for part of their shift or something or whatever. But it is it is big news if Chipotle does that. So arguably, if you are just trying to maximize the amount of utility in the world, you only want to shoplift against small family run businesses on the grounds that they they will on average be slightly slightly worse worse economic actors. But I don't think that's true either. I, I think that part of part of the reason to have these annoying arbitrary rules like don't steal instead of only steal when it's a good idea and don't don't do it otherwise is that we will spend all of our time debating edge cases if if we don't just draw some some fairly arbitrary bright lines and and then enforce things accordingly. And the you know the question of is shoplifting acceptable is kind of moot in a world where you can't prevent it anyway. It's It does become a question of, okay, how much do you want to prevent it? How much do you not? And at what point is there a trade-off that's no longer worth it? But in some cases, the the trade-off actually gets so favorable that you do actually have the debate over, okay, if we think, if most of us think this is a bad thing, should we completely eliminate it? Because we probably can. Or should we, should we eliminate the vast majority of it and just, you know, have some venues for slightly recreational shoplifting or something? You know, you probably do want to adjust the laws like among other things and this is like 
classic, you know, law and economic school of thought stuff, the punishment for a given crime is partly a function of the odds of detection. And you, you sort of, you want to calibrate your punishment so that it is negative expected value to commit the crime. So if, if the crime, if there is something where you could steal exactly a hundred dollars worth of it and sell it for exactly a hundred dollars offense, and you have a 10% chance of getting caught, well, the, the socially optimal fine is about a thousand dollars. So it is a break-even proposition to, to steal it, but slightly inconvenient. So people won't do it. But if the odds of getting caught go up to 100%, then a $1,000 fine is actually extremely excessive. You don't need to punish people nearly as aggressively just to stop that um, that particular act. If you can catch 100% of the people, then a fine of $100 is all you need. And at that point, you've sort of, you, you've sort of gotten this synthesis where you have just created an optional Amazon-style just-walk-out business where it's like, you either pay for the product legitimately at the register or you steal it. And then by the time you're walking out the store, a police drone has shown up, scanned your iris and immediately automatically forced you to Venmo at a hundred dollars as a fine. So yeah, we, it's like sometimes, sometimes like these, these big moral debates just go away because technology renders them obsolete. And, but then in other cases, you do have people who are really holding on to the debate. Like this, uh, this actually shows up a lot with discussions of geoengineering where Someone will say, you know, there's uh, sulfur has some some trade offs, but if we are trying to reverse global warming, that is the cost effective way to do it. And one of the critiques of that is, well, yeah, but then that would draw attention away from the less cost effective and more more revolutionary ways we could achieve the same end. Which, yes, it would. You know, cars cars do draw attention away from forces. Electric vehicles make Middle East political chaos a little bit, you know, much less salient to to people in the developed world. But that's like, that is good unless those problems have some moral worth on their own. And I think that they, they have incidental moral worth connected to the ends they're trying to achieve. And people, people sometimes confuse those, those means for the ends and it, it just makes the, the process really complicated. So, you know, going, going back to first principles is a really good way to make extremely catastrophic mistakes. You know, I think SBF was a very good first principles guy who did figure out the utility maximizing thing to do. And I think, I think in EV terms, as he more or less told the judge, he would do exactly the same thing again. Or you know, his, his regret is that he didn't he didn't get away with transferring more money to to the right causes, or didn't get didn't quite get around to donating all that much. So so first principles thinking it can be dangerous, but sometimes it is useful to to step back and ask like, what are we actually trying to accomplish? And I think this this applies to debates on crime because you know there's there's a large cohort. I think there's like this centrist plurality that believes that crime is bad, like you should not do it. And it is bad to be victimized by it. And you're a bad person if you perpetrate it on average, that there are going to be circumstances in which it's, you know, net the thing that you had to do for whatever reason, not all jaws are, not all laws are just all the time. Not all of them are enforced equitably all the time, et cetera. But yeah, for the most part, on average, you shouldn't, shouldn't do too much crime. And then you, you mentioned you know, we've talked about the cohort of people who believe that, no, it's actually good to to shoplift and some crimes are fine or like that there there's this kind of circular argument where it is bad, but you'd only do it if that were your least bad option. Therefore, anyone who actually does commit a crime is doing something that is not good for them, maybe. OK, but then I think there is on the other side, like it is worth pointing out there. There is a, a cohort of people who just really don't like criminals and want to punish them. And since criminals are not an especially politically popular group, like if you if you have a sort of punishment first approach to a lot of social problems, you definitely want to think a lot about crime and talk a lot about crime because it is a context in which, you know, talking about roughing people up for a bit and then, you know, publicly embarrassing them and then locking them in a cage for a while, surrounded by other fairly unpleasant people. You know, you you can't really talk about doing that to just like your political enemies, like people who disagree with you on capital gains taxes. No, you can't say we should lock them up. But you can say that about people who are mugging other people. So I think that in the interest of balance, we should recognize that there is going to be a cohort of people on for any political ideology who have pretty, pretty terrible motives and but that usually on average, most people are mostly their hearts are in the right place and they, they mostly want things that are just net good for the world. And with better technology, we uh, we can get more more of that. Yeah, that is an encouraging note. And the podcast as we are, as we just hit time here. Burn, as always, thanks for a great conversation. And until next week. Yes, indeed. All right. Great chatting. Thanks for listening to The Riff. Please go follow and subscribe, give us five stars, and check out Burns' excellent newsletter, The Diff, if you haven't already. 